All right, guys, uh, one of the last things we're going to talk about in this unit is going to be orthopedic injuries, so sprains, strains, fractures, all that fun. Um, so this is just a quick anatomy and physiology review. Just remember that there's three types of muscles, and uh, they do different things. So just be with those types. And there you go. Um, cardiac, obviously, in the heart. Skeletal is kind of that voluntary muscle. Smooth muscle is kind of involuntary, like organs, stuff. Um, okay, so... Um, this is no more A&P of just how muscles attach to the bones. Make sure you understand the difference between tendons and ligaments. Um, and this is just showing that the body uh, is going to constrict or dilate uh, depending on like the body's impulses. And just that the, the cardiac muscle has those intercalated discs or intercalated discs, however you want to call them. And uh, yeah, they help uh, run the heart's electrical system. Okay, keeping it simple, a fracture is a broken bone. Uh, a, there is a complication of compartment syndrome, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, okay, a subluxation is uh, kind of like halfway out. Um, what usually happens there is it will fully dislocate, and then right around that, the time of the injury, the body will almost like fix it, and then it'll kind of try to relocate, but it doesn't make it all the way in. So a common one is like right there, uh, the elbow. Uh, elbows are very tricky, uh, as we'll talk about it. I wouldn't uh, touch an elbow dislocation like that. That's a surgeon kind of thing. Okay, so a sprain is an injury to a ligament uh, or, you know, the synovial membrane or those kind of things. Um, but we really, um, the way to remember this is a strain is usually tendon-based. So there's a T in that word. So think strain for tendon. Uh, and that's stressing or tear of a muscle or like a tendon, and it's so pain, swelling, bruising, uh, lots of discomfort. Okay, an amputation is, uh, you know, a complete loss of a limb. Uh, and all they're saying here is that if you have, you have like the obvious injury of the impact or whatever happened, but you have a zone of injury that extends beyond that because there's lots of force involved. Okay, fractures are either closed or open. Uh, that's a pretty easy one to figure out. Um... And they can also be described if they're displaced or not. So like a non-displaced fracture just means a crack in the bone, more or less, whereas a displaced fracture means there's some sort of deformity, uh, the limb can be shortened, the bone can be poked out, those kind of things. Um, so just be familiar with these. Green stick is kind of think of like celery, like, you know, you can bend celery and it kind of starts to break, but it doesn't break all the way through. So that's kind of like, a, usually we see that in younger people, and that's kind of like a partial break. Uh, common nudid, which just means it's right, kind of right in half. Pathologic is uh, a fracture of a bone, but that's some usually from like osteoporosis or something like that. So if an older person breaks their hip, it's usually considered a pathologic fracture. Oblique just means there's a cross angle, and a transverse, it's right across the bone. Spiral is just a spiral, it kind of twists down, and it completes kind of similar to a green stick. Um, so there you go. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, just kind of be familiar with those. I might describe uh, a type of fracture and you got to figure out which one I'm talking about. Okay, so if we see any of these signs and symptoms in a patient, we should probably be worried about some sort of fracture. So deformity is going to look weird. It's not going to look right. Tender is going to be very painful. Guarding, that person's going to be like holding the limb and it's going to be uh, lots of swelling. And also some bruising. Crepitus is this kind of bag of Rice Krispies feeling. That's when like the bone fragments are, are rubbing up against each other. So it's almost like a vibration. False motion just means the, the joint is going a direction it shouldn't. Uh, exposed fragments, that's never good. Uh, very painful and a locked joint. So joints are supposed to move. So if they can't move, there's something wrong. Uh, okay, dislocation. So uh, the most commonly dislocated thing we're going to see is, is probably going to be a shoulder dislocation. And... Uh, especially in your younger uh, age population, uh, a lot of people like you're gonna you're gonna dislocate it a few times uh, because it, as it loosens up that joint the joint capsule and the, it's gonna dislocate temporarily. Even if you pop it back in, that joint capsule is still gonna be a little loose and you can re-dislocate it a lot easier. But if someone does have a dislocated, we'll just say shoulder. This is like the best example. Uh, it's gonna look it's gonna look different. You're gonna see some deformity. Uh, it's gonna be lots lots of swelling, uh, pain. Just kind of on average, but then pain uh, that's made a lot worse with movement. And if you start touching it, it hurts. Okay, so this is just like a dislocation of the finger. Um, we do need to be caring, caring about like kind of downstream effects. So if they have dislocated their wrist somehow, okay, well, how are the fingers doing? Or if they dislocated their finger, all right, well, what's the fingernail doing? Do we have blood flow 
past it. So kind of think desperate. Okay, a sprain is usually, and that's a ligament, and a ligament is connects bone to bone. And usually that's gonna be that's gonna be worse. So and it's more and more painful. So a sprain, think sprain pain, and it's, so it's usually more painful, and that's lower. Um, so and that's and the, right there, the ankle's a very common one we're gonna see. It's actually the um, anterior talofibular ligament is is that most commonly um, sprained ligament in the in the ankle. And like it's like eighty percent of uh, all sprains are gonna be from that one. Um, so you, you may not have a deformity, uh, we'll see. All right, compartment syndrome. So it takes about six to 12 hours to develop and it can happen from, uh, excessive bleeding in a location. So like you're a really bad crushed, some sort of crushed, uh, injury. Uh, or if, for example, like a tourniquet has been on for a while and then you loosen the tourniquet and all that blood starts moving around again, you can have compartment syndrome. So our muscles are in these little cool compartments almost like saran wraps kind of wrapped around them and it it can if it swells in there that saran wrap doesn't really want to stretch so but it'll swell it'll sw swell 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 and then it ends up actually like uh, collapsing the artery um, and the veins and everything so you can actually lose a limb compartment syndrome so um, these are going to be the, like, the most common sign symptoms of compartment syndrome so pain out of proportion like it just uh you know it doesn't it doesn't look super deformed it doesn't look um, broken or anything, but the pe the person's reporting like a nine out of ten pain. Um, if you start moving the limb for that person, they're they're gonna have a lot of pain there. Uh, pallor just means a discoloration, uh, decreased sensation. They're not gonna be able to feel things as well, and they're not gonna have a lot of power in that limb either. Um, so there's always complications are possible with these orthopedic injuries, and usually we're looking at things like the strength of the force that was applied, uh, where the injury occurred. And then the patient's overall health. Do they have any comorbidities um, existing? That is worse. Um, so this isn't, I'm not going to you know, put this in the test, but this is just kind of how they break it down. So uh, minor injuries all the way to critical injuries. So you can look at that, pause it if you want. Okay, vital signs, normal stuff, same as always. We want to make sure we get really good vital signs. Uh, if they are not bleeding, uh, let's just say they have a broken arm, and everything looks okay, but they're, they have a very uh, high heart rate, that's usually uh, pain. That usually is just because it's very painful, so the body's kind of amped up. Um, that's part of the reason we give pain control is because it's gonna calm those people down and all of a sudden their vitals improve. Okay, same stuff, we, we know this. Five minutes unstable, 15 minutes stable. Okay, splinting. Uh, um, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to practice this in class, but um, basically we wanna splint anything um, that is dislocated or fractured because um, all that excess movement is just going to make things worse. So uh, our pro after doing the ABCs and life threats and everything um, and kind of establishing our general impression, uh, one of the priorities is going to be trying to split those um, injuries. And this is why we want to do it. Uh, like I said, prevents further movement. Um, it, it can sometimes, um, you have to be careful, but like if that if that bone is fractured, it might actually be cutting off the circulation. So um, you can fix that and then splint it and then hopefully it'll stay that way. Um, so we want to remove clothing from the area. We can pad it, like we can pad the splint. That's okay, but we want to get the clothing out of the way so we can really see what we're doing and we're not worrying that the clothing is somehow in, uh, interfering with the splint. So uh, we want to, before we do anything, we want to make sure that that patient has that distal PMS, right? That distal pulse motor sensory. Um, and then that way, if we do the splint and we recheck it and now that person doesn't have it, okay, cool. We, we, the splint, something we did wrong on the splint, we got to fix it. So, like I said, we, we do want to pad it. Um, sham splints are okay, but I, I'm sure after, um, you know, after a certain amount of time, the sham splints probably do become a little painful. So, let's try and pad those splints uh, as much as possible. So, um, it's called like inline traction, which just means um, if you can, uh, without causing a whole lot of damage, you can, you know, we call the position of function. So, that's just where like the hand, is kind of loosely gripped around a part of the splint or something. That just means um, it's splinting in a way. Uh, okay, so attraction. Now, traction is most normally seen for uh, femur injuries. You can see in that picture there. So <clears throat> there's actually a traction splint, which is a device that actually puts a little uh, wrap around the ankle and it actually pulls the bone ends apart because those muscles like to be tight. So when those muscles, so when that bone fractures, the muscle is going to pull and, the, and that bone is going to be. Um, Kind of forced into itself and that can be very painful so a traction splint actually pulls that ankle away 
um, from that, and then therefore it reduces that pain and that kind of conflict between the two bone ends. However, traction splints are pretty much only used for the femur, um, and, and if it's a mid-shaft femur fracture. If you have something up in the acetabulum or something in the hip, uh, we don't want to be pulling on that with a traction splint. Okay, uh, rigid splints. So those are kind of like your, uh, I've seen cardboard, I've seen um, balsa wood, uh, sand splints. All those are, are, and sand splints kind of the difference between a rigid splint and a formable splint. Um, you can, the cool thing about sand splints is you can make it really, really rigid. If you put some creases in the splint itself, uh, it can be very, very rigid. So um, sometimes you need to do that. Uh, other times though, you can actually kind of mold the sand splint around the injury, uh, which is ideal. So um, there's, four, and there's also formable splints, which is, uh, some of those are like the air splints. And, um, you know, anytime there's a, a pocket of something filled with air, it can pop. So we, we have to be careful um, that the zipper is working and there's not anything in the way. Also, if you are doing different things in altitude, so you're on a mountain, you take a helicopter down or vice versa, uh, the, the air pressure changes can actually uh, affect the splint. Okay, so we talked about these traction splints already. I just wanted to talk about it when that picture was up. Um, so, like I said, mid-shaft femur fracture. We really don't want to be pulling on anything else except uh, mid-shaft femur fracture. All right, pelvic binder, there's a few of these. I can send a link of some of the different ones that are out there. Basically, it's it's just this big kind of wide strip. Uh, I've seen Velcro type fabric. Um, you can even do it with the patient's pants. You can do a few different things. All you're trying to do is hold it all in. So it's a pelvic binder. So just imagine like a book and like closing the book. It just kind of puts everything together. Now, the same problem with that. If there's a hip fracture, those hip bone ends can be rubbing up against each other. That can be very painful, cause a lot of damage. So we want to splint the pelvis. Um, you know, it's Best, best to our ability. Um, now, the reason why splinting is important and it takes practice is you can do it wrong. You, I've definitely seen some creative splints out there that ended up uh, actually harming the patient, so you need to be careful. Um, and they're saying here is, uh, you know, get to the hospital and move with a purpose, but if it's just a normal broken bone, uh, we don't need to take any risks there. Unless, of course, if there's a pulseless limb, that's more of a serious thing because now there's not blood flow down there and, and technically at that point the limb is starting to die so we need to move fast get a life flight to that for that okay uh collarbone clavicle scapula clavicle is the most commonly injured uh fractured uh bone in the body i broke my collarbone in eighth grade um and it just hurts uh, but the good news here is unless there's a lot of force applied um like an industrial accident tractor or something or other um, most of these people are going to be fine otherwise. It's, it's going to be very painful, I can tell you that, but um, it's not like you're worrying about a rib fracture, which and now you have to worry about lung involvement and stuff like that. Um, so collarbones are very common and relatively easy to manage. Now scapulas, well, it's much less frequent because the when the bone is uh, very well protected by muscles and also it's just kind of in a weird spot. So if there's some sort of fracture of the scapula, you can assume that there is a, a great amount of force applied person. Uh, sling and swath though, they, these were great. Um, I think some people downplay the importance of these things. Um, just like, oh, the patient, he can move, he's got PMS, like we're good. Well, that, that patient's body is actually kind of self-splinting and all the muscles and everything are kind of gripping uh, the injury. But if you put them in a sling and the arm can relax, all of a sudden those muscles actually relax and now the patient um, is going to actually have a lot less pain. And so the sling is kind of holds the arm up and a swath is the thing that goes around um, around the entire body, and it just keeps the elbow to the body, and that way we're not um, chicken. Um, so dislocator, or yes, yeah, so shoulder dislocations, like I said, very common, uh, very painful, but um, same thing, not super serious. Um, certain ER docs, like ortho ER docs, they, they can pop a shoulder in in four seconds. You know, they're, they're experts at it. There's a few different methods to do it. Um, some has to do with counterweight and pulling and pushing. Um, there's even one method where you kind of massage the deltoid and the body will usually kind of pull that joint back in where it's supposed to be. All right, so the humerus or arm bone, um, it's, that's a tough one because they say if, you, if you've lost that PMS, you can try and do traction one time. You can pull on it a little bit just to see if you get pulses back. If you do, splint it how it was and then um, use that sling. And... Okay, so this is the explanation of fractured uh, humerus. And so you can pause that if you want to look at that. I'm not on the test. I'm not going to specifically ask you how is your treatment different between the mid shaft and a proximal. 
And I don't think the National Registry would either. Okay, so elbow injuries, very tough, um, common in children. And there's lots of just stuff in that elbow joint. There's vessels and nerves and arteries, and it's a very important uh, joint. And if there's a dislocation, it's, it's very hard to tell what we have until we have an x-ray. So generally, we want to make sure that um, we splint it kind of as it lies. We want to make sure there's PMS, splint it as it lies, take it to the hospital. I, I wouldn't fool around with a, a elbow dislocation. I wouldn't be pulling up a lot. Um, so you can have an elbow sprain, and sometimes it is uh, mistakenly you know, misdiagnosed. But that's the thing. It's, it's hard to tell without an x-ray. It's really hard to tell on um, arm, really arm fractures in general. Um, sometimes you, you just, you need the x-ray. Um, so these are just different examples of all the different kind of arm injuries we might encounter. So, um, so yeah, what they're saying here is that kind of, it's an important joint, splints it best you can, make sure that they have that distal uh, perfusion and it's possible. So uh, fractured forearm, so fractures of the distal radius, or known as a Collie's fracture. You might see that on the test, I don't know. Um, same idea, padded splints uh, and, and evac. Um, all this stuff needs specialists and x-rays and, and all that. So uh, the priority there is um, pain control, making sure there's no other injuries and to the hospital. So pelvis, um, oddly enough, I know this sounds crazy. I had a patient in Vanderbilt who got run over by a steamroller. He actually got crushed. He was on the back of it. It was backing up. He fell off and it ran him over. Um, he actually uh, was going to survive. His pelvis is completely shattered. Um, the, at least when I, the, the one time I saw him in the ICU, they weren't even fully sure how to do surgery on it because he had so many bone fragments. But um, everything else was okay, and the doctors were thinking if they could stabilize that pelvis, that um, he was going to make a full recovery. And so, uh, of course, unfortunately, I don't know what happened. Um, now, so we just kind of have to assume if there's any issue or pain in the pelvis. Uh, difficulty walking, things like that. You got to be real careful. Um, you can, so yeah, you can assess for tenderness, but we want to get away from us really grossly manipulating the pelvis because um, if there's a fracture, you know, we could be severing arteries uh, while we're doing that. So what they're kind of saying here is you're just kind of just pressing a little bit in. You're you're assessing the integrity of the whole pelvis, and so you're just pressing in a little bit um, just to kind of see if it's stable and how much pain that creates, but. You're not, you're not grossly uh, moving it around. Um, some people, this is very hard to tell without an x-ray, dislocation of the hip as uh, uh, maybe compared to like a pelvic fracture. Those can be kind of hard to tease out. So um, once again, you need to uh, take that person to the hospital. Uh, one time, uh, so one thing that you can notice is you're going to see severe pain in the hip, strong resistance to the movement. Like it's, it's, just, it's not going to want to move uh, normally. It's going to be very painful. Um, so we don't want to reduce, we call it, uh, so if something is dislocated and you pop it back in, we call that reduced. We don't want to reduce the hip in the field at all. Same idea. It's kind of like the elbow. Lots of complicated stuff going on in there. Uh, me personally, even as a paramedic, I don't think I'd mess around uh, with a dislocated hip. I would, I would splint it. I'd um, put them on a backboard if there was some, you know, spinal trauma. Uh, I'd pad it best as possible, and I would take to the hospital uh, as quickly as I could. So the proximal femur, this is a, a pretty common fracture point in the elderly people. It's kind of like that, that the neck of the femur, if you uh, can imagine a femur. Um, and sometimes you're going to see that leg externally rotated and it's going to be shorter. So uh, with all those, though, we want to assess the pelvis for those uh, injuries, check PMS, and then do our best to do like some sort of pelvic binder and evac. Okay, we already talked about this. Um, those large muscles of the thigh, they spasm to kind of splint the, the bone. That can cause a lot of damage. Uh, bone fragments may penetrate or press into uh, nerves, uh, nerves and arteries and veins and all that stuff. Um, so you can have a lot of bleeding with those, even internal. Uh, so do your best to, uh, it's preferred to do a traction splint, but um, if not, then just splint uh, any, really any way you can. Um, take it to the hospital as quick as possible. Okay, injuries to the knee. There's lots of ligaments in the knee. I'm sure you guys have, you know, watched on sports when that's so-and-so uh, injured as ACL or PCL or whatever. So those are all different types of ligaments that wrap around the knee. The knee is actually a pretty complicated joint when you look at those, how those ligaments kind of wrap around it. So if there is a tear or a break or something in some of those ligaments, uh, swelling, and I'm talking a lot of swelling. I saw one guy in a jump who his knee was like almost the size of a basketball. I mean, within under 20 minutes, his knee was just massive. 
Um, sometimes you can see bruising. It's going to be very painful, and it's going to there's going to be lots of fluid. It's going to be like a big water balloon um, all of a sudden in the knee. Um, so splint it best you can. Evac. Dislocation. Um, this is this is a kind of worse because the other one um, it was like maybe one or two ligaments, but if you have a dislocated knee, um, it's probably a few ligaments are involved now. So it's it's a lot more complicated, and that's you know that's a surgical correction kind of thing. Okay, so and this is what, and this is why we're we're worried about dislocations of the knee because they could they can cut off or injure that popliteal artery which runs right behind the knee. Uh, it can damage all those nerves, and um, you know hopefully these people can get a normal life after this and continue to run and, and walk and actually move. Uh, but if if you have a uh, a bad knee, I mean that can impact people's lives pretty significantly. Okay, so these are just some areas of fractures. Um, I'm not going to uh, ask about this, like on the test specifically. Uh, it's kind of the generalizations of orthopedic injuries. Um, so, uh, last thing with Anita, that if you check PMS and everything's good, splint it how it lies. Don't mess with it, um, because that's uh, that, that's what we want. And they say don't ever use a traction splint because you know we're pulling now, we're pulling the, the joint apart, and we don't know what's going on inside there, and um, lots of damage could happen with the traction splint. Okay, uh, dislocation of the patella. Uh, yeah, it's usually more of an athletic, you know, active person's um, injury. Uh, usually it'll dislocate to the side, the lateral side. Uh, but generally, um, I mean, these are painful, but there's not going to be certainly not like a life-threatening or anything. So splint and uh, take them to the hospital. Okay, these are just uh, tib-fib injuries. Um, these ones are easy uh, to make a splint. You basically make a boot and you just kind of wrap it in the boot and you're good to Ankle injuries, um, and so you can you end up basically doing the same splint. Um, you make a big boot that goes, you know, halfway up the leg or something, or halfway up to the knee, and wrap it nice and tight. Just make sure PMS intact. Okay, foot injuries. So this is just more of um, of like the the injuries of that area. But under, also understand that if you got some damage in the foot, let's say someone fell and they got a broken foot because they fell, there was enough force to break the bone. That means there's enough force that could have, you know shot up their body and was absorbed in the spine. So anytime you see a, a fall like that, you always want to be thinking of spinal trauma. Spinal trauma. Okay, splint the foot and leave the toes exposed. Uh, we we kind of need that to check capillary fill and pulses and stuff. Okay, uh, compartment syndrome. This is just kind of a, a refresher on that because it is something we're worried about um, and it can it happens with lots of different injuries. So we want, we want to splint it best we can and uh, they say compartment syndrome must be managed surgically. Yeah, they go in there and they do a fasciotomy and they take a scalpel and they actually cut open all the muscle compartments so this so it can swell and then they manage that swelling, it goes down and you know a person can recover. But without that surgery, um, there's a good chance a person could actually like lose their limb. Okay, amputations. Um, surgeons can occasionally reattach amputated parts. There's more and more technology um, every day that comes out that lets us do that. So if there is a amputated part. Um, we want to we want to um, take that to the hospital with us, and we'll see if the uh, can reattach it. So we want to wrap the part in a clean, sterile dressing, place in a plastic bag. Now, a cool container filled with ice, just to keep it cool, right? But what we do not want to do is put it on the ice because you can literally give an amputated arm frostbite, uh, and that's just the last thing we want to deal with, you know, as we're trying to attach a limb or something. So keep it cool, but not in ice. Okay, strains, um, it says uh, often deformity is present and only minor swelling is noted. Um, that can happen, some, you know, basketball players, they, you know, you see them run and they, they um, zigzag and they just fall over and you, it doesn't look like anything even happens. So sometimes there's not going to be a massive deformity uh, with these, with these um, strains. Oh, that's what I meant, strains. Um, so uh, increased sharp pain with passive movement, severe weakness of the muscle, and extreme point tenderness. Um, so those are kind of the signs we're looking for. Uh, rices, if you guys have, do not know about this, um, it, this is, I would take this with you the rest of your life. Um, any sort of joint, bone, muscle injury, whatever, we can always apply rices uh, or rice, depending on uh, the acronym you want to use. So we want to rest it. We want to use ice or some sort of cold that does actually help limit swelling. Uh, we do want to compress it. Same idea. We're kind of limiting that swelling. Elevate it will help drain some of that extra fluid. We want to um, kind of reduce your protected weight bearing. Uh, if it's injured, we want to give it a nice, um, good rest. And that's why you see those things like those knee scooters and stuff like that. So you're, you're getting some weight bearing, but you're not doing the full load. 
and okay, then that's just a sprain. And err instead of caution and treat every sprain as a fracture because you just you may not know uh, at the end. So these are signs and symptoms. Um, sometimes it is very hard to tell the difference between a sprain and a strain. So so splint it if you need to. Make sure PMS is intact. Um, do all those things and go to the hospital. So that was a quick down and dirty orthopedic um, orthopedic lecture. And I will post some videos um, in the comments um, about just different things, filling in on like compartment syndrome, and I can send a, a video of the fasciotomy they do. It's uh, pretty powerful stuff.